Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 92, recorded February 27th, 2013. Corey Doctorow. Triangulation is brought to you by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker looking for video, photos, illustrations, music, sound effects, after effects, templates, or 3D models, check out Pond5. And for an exclusive 50 free stock media files, go to pond5.com slash triangulation. It's time for Triangulation, the show where we cover, actually talk to, converse with, interact with, uh, great minds, people who are thinking deep thoughts, who are writing great things. It's always a f pleasure for me because I get to pick the people we get to talk to. And today, an old friend, a great friend, and a, a guy who's a total inspiration, Corey Doctorow, joins us on Triangulation. He is on a book tour for his newest book, which is a sequel to Little Brother, which was incredible. It's called Homeland, and he's somewhere in the, the center of the United States. He's in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Hi, Corey. Oh, hey there. How are you? <laughs> City 21 out of 24. Yeah. But yeah. we were saying before we started, that's it's very unusual for publishers to do book tours anymore. This is unheard of. Yeah, they really believe in this. In fact, this is like the third tour they've sent me on in the last six months because I've had a whole ton of books out. I had I had Rapture of the Nerds out with Charlie Strauss, and we did like a little Northeastern tour. And then I had a, a six-week tour for Pirate Cinema in September or in, yeah, September, October. And now I'm on a, a four-week but 23-city tour. So it's pretty intense. Congratulations. Yeah, well, it's working. Uh, the the Homeland just hit the New York Times bestseller list for the third week running. Awesome, just like Little Brother. That's great. Yeah. So this is a young adult book. It is. But don't that I hate to even say that because everybody I talk to, every adult I talk to, loved Little Brother and loves Homeland, and doesn't think of it as a young adult book at all. So I think young adult literature is best understood as books that a young adult librarian can shelve without getting fired. <laughs> it doesn't mean that they are books that only young adults can enjoy. Exactly. It means that they are books that um, are age appropriate for young adults. But but things that are age appropriate for young adults aren't age inappropriate for older adults. No, in fact, these deal they, both of these books, Little Brother and Homeland, deal with some pretty heavy topics: terrorism economic collapse, they're a little dystopian. Uh, it's not happy-go-lucky. Well, there's Burning Man, too. There's Burning Man. <laughs> and that's not that's not something, I'm surprised that a librarian, <laughs> that's a young yeah, adult. Yeah. <laughs> do, you go to, do you go to Burning Man? You don't go to Burning yeah, Man. Yeah, I do. You know, I've only just started going pretty recently, last couple, three years. Oh. Uh, and funnily enough, when I lived in San Francisco, I never went, despite right. the fact that it would have been very easy, because the World Science Fiction Convention always conflicted with it. Oh. And my wife talked me into going on, uh, on our joint 40th birthday a few oh. years back. And we had such a good time camping out with our friends from Liminal Labs, who are people I know from San Francisco, that it basically convinced me that from now on I'm pretty much blowing off the World Science Fiction Convention every year wow. if, it, if it happens to conflict. But you're not bringing Posey yet. Not yet. No, this is kind of a grown-up holiday from the kids. So what, the way that it usually works is I fly to Toronto with Posey and have some time with, our fam with my family, with her family, leave her there with my parents, and then meet Alice in Vegas, and then we head on to Burning Man. So do you recommend, does somebody need to read uh, Little Brother before they read Homeland, or does it stand on its own? No, you know, what I did with Homeland, I, I tried to approach it the way that you would um, approach, like, the backstory of an alien civilization in science fiction. I, it, good science fiction doesn't start with, like, a biography of the world that you're in. Instead, it, it drops in little hints, what um, the writer Joe Walton, she calls it in-cluing, where you just clue the reader in with little hints about what's gone on before. So I treat Homeland as kind of the fictional world. Uh, or rather, Little Brother is kind of the fictional world from which Homeland is derived, and add little bits and pieces that kind of help you figure out what happened in it. If you've read Little Brother, there are some Easter eggs. There's some, you know, it's, it's probably yeah. more fun. Yeah, yeah, but but you don't have to have read Little Brother. It's definitely a standalone sequel. I like that uh, phrase, including. Yeah, yeah. Joe's very clever. Joe wrote, uh, I think, one of the best novels about science fiction, if not a science fiction novel, in many, many years called um, 
Uh, oh, I have, gosh. I, I have it on my Audible. I just I downloaded it. Somebody it, told won, me to... it won the World Fantasy. Among, is it among, and, among others? Among others, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I did, I, somebody, who was it, was telling me that you've got to read this. It, it's yeah, not science absolutely. fiction, it's about science fiction. Yeah, that's right. It's a fantasy novel about science fiction. Yeah, I can't wait. It's on my list. Do you do you don't put do you put these on audiobooks or you uh, you know I try um they the all of them except for that one Random House did audio on but the thing is that I won't allow them to be released without DRM right. uh, or with DRM, with DRM rather DRM, and right. and 90% of the market is controlled by a company that requires DRM of its authors and that's unfortunately it's Audible right, and right. Uh, and so since they won't let me um uh, release my works without DRM. We don't sell through them, and I guess Random House felt like it was too much of a bite to take to to give up ninety percent of the market because right. they're not doing it for this one. But you know, we did that very successful humble bundle uh, last time around with Pirate Cinema and the eBooks, and I've been talking with them about a pirate, uh, about a humble audiobook bundle. And I think if we did that, I would private privately commission an audiobook of um, Homeland for the bundle. Well, call me. I'd love to do it. With you. Really? You know, I was thinking of Will Wheaton, actually, but you'd be well, awesome. Could, no, he's he's a bigger celebrity, though. You get get Will Wheaton to do it. Well, I, I just think he'd have the right voice for yeah, like a would. teen. It's a younger tag. voice, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Just, and, I you know, I could be the old man. You, you, need, you got an old man? I'll be an old man. There's an old man in there. Both <laughs> of them, have both both of you and he, have read my work aloud, yeah. and you've both done amazing work with it. Yeah, it's really fun to read out loud because yeah. it's very natural. It flows very uh, beautifully, and you you write so beautifully. Tell me a little bit about. Is the, is this a future you worry about in Little Brother and, and now in Homeland? Yeah, you know, I think we're like we're we are about to invent a future, and in that future, either our computers will do what we say; their default posture will be "Yes, Master," or computers will try and push us around, and their default posture is going to be "I can't let you do that, Dave," um, because there are so many different entities, so many groups of people who really think that it would be better if your computer didn't do exactly what you asked it to, if it if it prevented you from doing some things that would cause some harm, like saving a DVD to your hard drive or saving a stream or uh, playing uh, an app in a platform other than Apple's or loading uh, an app that Apple didn't blast into Apple's platform. They're just like, there's this kind of emergent conspiracy of different interests that all want computers to hide things from their owners and to enforce policy against their owners. And that's growing and growing at speed. And my fear is that you can't really make a computer a little bit pregnant. Once you uh, rejig it so that it's designed to hide things from its owners and, and betray them, betray their interests, then other people will figure out how to add more horrible ways of betraying you. Just like when, um, uh, in Germany, the, the Bavarian government got caught sneaking spyware onto the computers of people they wanted to keep an eye on. It was it was an illegal wiretapping measure. And the Chaos Computer Club discovered this spyware. They called it the Bundestrojaner or State Trojan. And what they found was that after your computer was infected with the Bundestrojaner and had the spyware that allowed the covert operation of the camera and the microphone and access to the hard drive and so on over the internet, that anybody could insert themselves into it. You could go to like a Starbucks and uh, find other people who had uh, who had been infected using a network scanner, and then you could kind of ride piggyback on the police and the government and spy on those people too. And once you start designing computers to hide things from their computer from their owners, it, it just never stops. I think. Well, and who trusts the government? I mean, yeah, sure, bad guys could get access to it, but you, but you don't trust the government to do it either. Well, I mean, yeah, but but I think it's important to note that even if you did trust the government, that this wouldn't be an effective it's way for enough. the government to surveil people, right. Right? right? Because, you know, just like in the in the 1990s, AT&T ran all of its Kalia interception hardware right. off a of sunbox. So that that's the hardware that police departments use if they want to if they have a warrant for a wiretap after the 1990s, after the passage of a law called Kalia, uh, they didn't have to go down to the central office and affix a tap to a switch. Instead, Kalia mandated that switches would have back doors, that you could you could have a, a computer you'd log into with the police login. And then after that, you could wiretap any number. You could do you could do uh, pen traces or, or, or eavesdropping on any number. And um, that the Kalia box that AT&T ran through the 90s was totally compromised. Organized crime used it, hackers used it. And so what that meant is that as soon as you added a back door to the phone network, the phone network was backdoored. Right. And there's like not really any two ways around that. Right. You you can't backdoor something and then not have it be backdoored in the same way that um, 
uh, in Greece, they don't actually turn on the Kalia interception stuff. They they don't they don't have a Kalia law, but all the switches they buy are designed for sale in the U.S. market, and so they have the Kalia backdoor. And during the uh, Athens Olympic bid, some party unknown, presumably a government actor, snuck into their switch. Yeah. Uh, their major switches and turned on their Kalia stuff huh. and used that to listen in on wow. conversations all the way up to the prime minister's office. Wow. In, in the same way, you know, when, when Google got hacked in China and the Chinese government intercepted all that Gmail, that, that um, Gmail from dissidents, they used the lawful interception backdoor for that too. Like there's, it's, it's just kind of, it's like a tautology, right? You can't make a computer right. more secure by adding a backdoor. Right, right. We're talking to Cory Doctorow. His newest book, Homeland, uh, just came out. It's in hardcover. It's available everywhere. It's definitely a great read, especially if you want to go to Burning Man without getting dusty. <laughs> <laughs> I don't and, know how you do that. <laughs> and, well, you know what? It's so accurate you feel dusty. And, yeah. and at the end, uh, there's an afterword, uh, kind of poignantly, by Aaron Schwartz. Yeah. Um, in which he says, uh, this stuff is real. Um, you, did you know Aaron? Yeah, I knew Aaron for more than half his life. Yeah. Um, when I lived in San Francisco and Aaron was a uh, 14-year-old contributing to RSS, um, my then-girlfriend, the, the very nice and lovely Lisa Ryan, had volunteered to be his chaperone when he came to San Francisco for face-to-face -face meetings. She was, she was involved in W3C standard settings. And so she used to pick him up at the airport, and since I was her boyfriend, we'd, we'd go out with him together, and we'd drive him around town, and we'd, we'd take him you know, to meet people, and we'd, we'd take him out to restaurants and marvel his, at his horrific eating habits. He only ate white food. We'd only <laughs> eat uh, french fries and boiled potatoes and like pizza with nothing on it and yogurt and and white toast and steamed rice but not fried rice because it wasn't white enough and uh, you know you, you could you could listen to him talk while while he was eating this horrible diet and you'd realize that this was a kid who was really going places yeah. that like something amazing would happen to him if he didn't die of scurvy first <laughs> you, in fact it was ha I learned of Aaron's death uh, in fact in, in boing boing in your in your uh, very moving mm -hmm. piece about him Thank you. Um, yeah, and then of course started to read more and more Larry Lessig and every and just the the outpouring. Yeah. His his uh, did you go to the funeral? Is the service? I did. Yeah. yeah. So I got the word that Aaron had died while I was in Toronto. My wife had count, gone home from our Christmas holiday early to get back to work. She's she's running a startup, and I stayed on with my daughter so she could have a little more time with her grandparents. And uh, a couple of days before we were to leave. Uh, I got the word. My wife called me from London and said that um, our mutual friend, who was also a friend of Aaron's, Quinn Norton, had come over to our place. She was she was visiting and and with the news. And um, so yeah, when they announced that the funeral was going to be a couple of days later in Chicago, I bought a ticket from Toronto to Chicago and and I flew over. And then I flew back right after the funeral. I didn't get to go to the Shiva house. I went straight back and, and met my parents at the airport with my daughter. And we, we had a, a ticket we couldn't change to go back to London that night. So that's what we did. Uh, uh, and it was really, it was a it was a terrible way to get back in touch with so many old friends oh, as funerals yeah. so often are. Yeah. But it really, it made me realize that I was about to go out and speak to thousands, if not tens of thousands of people in person about this book that Aaron had helped me write, because he didn't just write the afterword. There's a bit in the book where uh, I describe a kind of next generation political campaign where someone gets elected without a party machine and without major donors to whom he would be beholden after taking office. And I wrote to all these different campaign strategy people to say how, to see how they would run something like that. And they all had like answers that were kind of inside Beltway, inside baseball, inside the box. But then I wrote to Aaron and like, um, a couple hours later, he fired me back like a full-on design document for a thing that he called a machine for getting votes, a, a system for getting the vote out without a lot of money, without a party affiliation, just based on the principles of the candidate. So the candidate would owe nothing to anyone except for the voters. And it was so good, like it was shovel-ready. I pasted it straight <laughs> into the book, except for the last two sentences, which were, I got to go, I'm going to go build this now. And, and that's in there, that's in the book. And, and um you know, it made me think when I thought about that, that I was going to have to go out on tour with this book and talk to people about about how I came to write it and what Aaron had contributed to it. And the thing that I say now when I talk about this is that all of the things that Aaron did, he did not do any of them because information wants to be free. You know, I had a, a long, intimate heart to heart with information and it confessed to me that the only thing it wants from us is for us to stop anthropomorphizing it. Um, <laughs> 
you know, people do want to be free. And the projects that Aaron embarked on and the stuff that we talk about in the book, those are ways that you make people more free with information. Like when Aaron liberated $1.5 million worth of course files uh, from the proprietary Pacer database and put them into the Open Recap database, that made people more free because knowing what the law is makes you more free than someone who doesn't know what the law is. And when he went after the JSTOR database of all those scientific articles that describe the world as best as we understand it, uh, presumably with the intention of making them more widely available. He was doing it because people are more free if they know the truth of the world. And, you know, when we pass laws that prohibit circumvention, that prohibit but taking apart devices to see how they work, we make it impossible for security researchers to um, discover their flaws and tell us about them so we can know whether our devices are betraying us or listening to us, whether they're doing what the Bundestrojaner did or, or like many other examples I could name of, of lawful interception gone wild where school or other institutions have spied on people using their own equipment and they didn't know about it and didn't find out about it until the other side slipped up. And really what we want is for, for, for hackers and for um, researchers to know that if they take apart a computer, if they decompile it or reverse engineer it and that it is some way betraying its owners, that they should be safe in disclosing that so that we can all know whether our devices are safe or not uh, and not worry about facing legal repercussions. It's very fitting. The last words of the book are Aaron's words in his afterword. He says, uh, now that you've read this book and learned how to do it, you're perfectly suited to make it happen again. He's talking about Koika and later SOPA. Uh, that's right. Now it's up to you to change the system. And then he says, sadly, let me know if I can help. Um, yeah. al although ironically, I think in many ways his death did help. Um, you can't rationalize it, but yeah. I think it did, you know, it did galvanize some people to, to get to work. It, it's true. But you know, if that's, if that's why he, I don't enough. think that's why he did it, but if that's no. why he did it, then I disagree with him on tactics. Yeah, I don't think that's why he did it. You obviously. Know? No, I, 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 and one of the other things I've been talking about with this book is the fact that, um, you know, people get depressed more than we talk about. Mm -hmm. People can be so depressed that they're idle. And uh, many of us have felt that way at one time or another. And, you know, there are legitimate reasons to feel that low. You know, you don't have to be facing a 35-year prison sentence to feel that low. And I felt that low. But, but you know, the one thing you can be sure of is that if you're dead, you won't solve your problems. Dead people don't do anything, right? They don't solve right. problems. You can't iterate your way from death. You can't go, well, that didn't work. What else can I try? And, you know, our networks allow us to know so much about one another. You can use your network device to find out, you know, where your friends are by looking at their fair four square, by looking at what they, their Instagram, you can know what they're eating by looking at their Facebook. You can know what they're talking about, but you shouldn't assume unless you've asked them and unless you've listened very carefully that you know what they're feeling. And we can just as we to use devices and make devices that make us more free instead of devices that take our freedom away, we can choose to use our devices to take care of each other mm. uh, instead of allowing our devices to atomize us and to, to alienate us. Mm -hmm. And it takes an affirmative choice. It, it takes not just using Twitter to trade Bon Mo and not just using Facebook to kind of talk about what's going on, but to actually ask each other using our tools how we're feeling and to listen carefully. Boy, that's a great message. I don't know. I, I agree with you 100%. You know, we actually were having a similar conversation on our last show on This Week in Google about Google Glass, and it could go both ways. It could be used to separate you, to, mm -hmm. to, to put up a wall between you and the world, as, and social media often is used that way. But it's, it is an opportunity to do the opposite, isn't it? To connect. Yeah, I think that, you know, technologies have affordances that kind of the way they're used, but uh, those affordances are designed in or designed out according to what we say we want to do with them. And we can, you know, we can socialize, for example, on the internet. We could find a way of socializing without allowing a thug in a hoodie to affect a man in the middle attack on the whole of human civilization if we chose to. And, and you know, I think we should choose that. And I think that, you know, it's up to technologists to build the services and tools that let us do that. But it's up to us to also value systems, not, not just for how well they work, because Facebook works very well, but how badly they fail. And Facebook fails very badly in that it causes you to so systematically undervalue your privacy. Right. You know, if you want a, an example of that, add up the market cap of Facebook divided by the number of users they have and realize that all of your disclosures to Facebook together are worth mere pennies on the market. Yeah. You know, it strikes me, um, 
you, you, in everything we've just we've been talking about, there, it, it, there, there are polar opposites. Uh, there's, it's a, it, it's a dark and a light. There's uh, open and closed. There's, um, uh, uh, you know, a dystopia and a utopia. There's, um, there's a back doors and there's freedom. Do you see the world that way? Is it? Is it? Is there this kind of polarity between is it, those? Is it binary? Is it binary? Is there a polarity between people who want to control us? And uh, and freedom. I mean, how it, it's it sounds binary. I don't think it is. You know, here's what I think. Everything we do today involves computers, and everything we do tomorrow will require computers and the internet. And as a result, every problem we have involves computers. Not because computers cause the problem, but in the same way that they all involve clothes, right? Uh, you know, you you'll often hear after um, uh, a horrific crash. The the uh, killer played video games, but right. you know if the killer is like between four <laughs> and did. fifty, <laughs> yeah. the remarkable thing would be that he didn't play video right. games, right? Right. Um, and in the same way, computers are at the are, are somewhere in the middle of every problem we have because because computers are in the middle of everything we do. But there's this impulse to solve, and I think it's sometimes an honest impulse to solve a problem by changing the computer. By, by uh, mandating that computers be designed to run every program except for the one program that pisses us off. Right. And the problem is that we don't have a model for that. Our closest model to that is the spyware, right? The, the, pro, the I can't let you do that, Dave, program that lurks in your computer waiting for you to do something prohibited and then kind of leaps to the fore and prevents it. And, and it's, it's not so much that everybody wants to control everything we do. It's that there is often a kind of depraved indifference to the uh, consequences of what we do. So take, for example, the fact that um, governments in the name of electronic surveillance which we, or, or espionage, which sometimes they call um, cyber war, although I think conflating surveillance and war is, is, is uh, or espionage and war is, is a bit silly. Mike Masnick wrote about this this morning. He said, espionage is what you do so you don't fight wars. Mm. Uh, but but electronic espionage uh, and sabotage has led governments to start buying zero-day vulnerabilities right. on the open market. So right. the U.S. government and other markets, they, they buy bugs that have been discovered in software that have not yet been reported to the manufacturer because those bugs can be used to break into the computers of people who they want to do something bad to, who they want to watch. Um, and so one of the bugs that are most highly treasured are embedded system bugs because that's the thing that lets you write viruses like Stuxnet that go after nuclear reactors and so on. And so embedded system bugs are 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 very likely now, if they're discovered, to be um, hidden instead of disclosed. So and and so they're never patched. Right. Now that matters because embedded systems are implanted systems. Uh, the computers that we put in our body run embedded operating systems. So for example, uh, Barnaby Jack gave this presentation in Australia last November about implanted defibrillators. And he showed that he could detect the wireless signal from your de implanted defibrillator from 30 feet away, and that he could reprogram your implanted defibrillator to serve as a viral vector to seek out other implanted defibrillators and infect them, and then to deliver lethal shocks at either a set interval or sometime in the future. And you know, those bugs will exist in our embedded systems, and I think we all want the incentive for everyone who discovers those bugs <laughs> yeah. to responsibly disclose them so that they get patched yeah. and not to be kind of turned into something that is a, a valuable commodity by the NSA because they want to be able to, to run, you know, James Bond spy scenarios of shutting down nuclear reactors with Stuxnet. But getting back to this black and white world, you, you're more nuanced, I'm sure, than seeing it in black and white. Maybe it's just easier to tell the story that way, though. Yeah, I mean, in 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 fact, I hope I kind of get into some of those gray areas in Homeland because on the one hand, Homeland is a book in which someone is uh, Marcus, the the main character, is in possession of this huge trove of secrets that were liberated from government and corporate computers that uh, indicate all kinds of wrongdoing. But he's also having his own computer compromised by people who think that he's not disclosing that fast enough, and so he has to cope with the ethics of what it means. To have your computer compromised, to, to have your computer right. compromised by someone who thinks that your secrets should be out there in the public and doesn't mind if it compromises you. And so in, in, in having him run through the, the very viscerally those moral questions, I hope that I give the reader a sense that this is not a black or white issue, that, that liberating secrets on the one hand can make the world a better place, but on the other hand can um, do enormous harm to people 
who don't deserve it. Sounds like it was inspired by Bradley Manning and uh, WikiLeaks. Certainly, there's a lot of WikiLeaks in there, and and also the the Jacob Applebaum stuff. You know, he wrote the other afterward. Right. He and Aaron both wrote afterwards, and Jake is one of the WikiLeaks volunteers. And you know, he's he he um he doesn't leak. He doesn't help leak. He's a spokesman. But as a result, every time he crosses the U.S. border, he's detained by Customs and Border Patrol for hours and hours. And they always – they ghost all of his equipment. They they copy all of his drives. So he now travels with just blank equipment. So his phone <laughs> – he says he only – um. He only loads the names of people he doesn't like into his phone. Uh, and then he, he his thumb drives, he keeps copies of the Bill of Rights on them. Awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, yeah, he he he, uh, he says, what if you could travel back through time and help Daniel Ellsberg leak the Pentagon Papers? Would you do it? Would you risk your life to end uh, the Vietnam War? Um, but it, but, it, but he, he even re refers to the fact that it's more morally complex than that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the thing about that afterward that I really liked is the fact that although much of the code in free and open source software is contributed by people who are just scratching their own itches, that taken together, it amounts to a profoundly compassionate moral act on behalf of the human race to make code that makes us more free. Because yeah. especially in, in the world that we live in now where the copyright wars has resulted in the passage of laws that makes it illegal to, to, to jailbreak devices, to remove DRM, um, it's very hard for the people who are um, technically capable of discovering ways in which our devices might be compromising our privacy or our integrity to publish what they find, to disclose what they find, because they always have to worry, am I going to end up like – uh, Geohots. Am I going to end up like Trevor Eckhart, where disclosing a flaw in a system results in my facing enormous criminal and civil liability? Um, and, you know, by having open systems out there, you have systems where the flaws can be disclosed without worrying about running afoul of, of the DMCA, of the anti-circumvention rules. And that means that to the extent that we use open systems, we make ourselves somewhat immune to to the kind of horrific disclosures that we've seen, for example, when the school district in Lower Marion, Pennsylvania, oh. uh, loaded spyware onto the laptops they gave to all the kids, um, supposedly to help them recover stolen laptops, but they used it to take thousands of photos of these kids at home and at school, awake and asleep, dressed and undressed, because they were looking for discipline cases. Yeah. Uh, it's fun. I love it that you're a little bit of a subversive, Corey. I guess I don't have to tell you that. But I mean, this when you say this is a young adult book, this is a very subversive book. In fact, Jacob Applebaum says, "Happy hacking." You know, he says, yeah. "Make sure you understand that there's a difference between legal and illegal, and right and wrong." Mm -hmm. And uh, the implication is that some things that are illegal are right. And well, they, I mean, I everyone who's ever jailbroken an iPhone has done something illegal right. that I think is right. So yeah, I think it's hard to argue that case. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I, I hope that these books will be more like verbs than nouns. I hope that they'll be something you do, not just something you have. And that's why, you know, there's a series of instructables based on okay. each of the books that explains Ooh. how to build the technology that's in the books. Oh, that's that the neat. Those folks put together. Yeah, it was very cool. One of my old um, interns from EFF went to work at Instructables and got them involved in this. Uh, and um, that's why there's the bibliographies and the afterwards and all that stuff that explains how to make the stuff that's in the book. And one of the challenges I set myself in the books was to build technology uh, in the books, imaginary technology that was uh, possible, if not real. Uh, rather than writing the kind of techno thriller where all the computers go brrr, 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 as the all caps blue on white type rolls across the screen, <laughs> I wanted a book full of computers that acted as interestingly and 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 with as much um, excitement as as the computers that I know do. A techno thriller that was really about the technology, and as a result, the books are full of stuff that you can build, that your kids can build, that you can build with your kids to um, hack your world, to configure your world, to make your world more the way you want it, and to make yourself more free with technology. So, Plus, there's some good coffee recipes. <laughs> you, you talk about an AeroPress in here. Is that your uh, current coffee uh, brewing uh, choice? 
Yeah, when I'm on the road, I have two two ways I brew coffee. Uh, the first is with an AeroPress, and then I also do cold brew in mini bars. And the wow. way that I do that cold brew is where you um you you take ground coffee and combine right. it with cold water, and you steep it in an airtight container, and then you strain it. And you never heat it up, and you get iced coffee that's that's beautiful. It's very strong, but not at all bitter, and right. very very caffeinated. And the way that I do that in a mini bar is I have uh, breast milk bags, and I put some <laughs> ground coffee in the bottom of them because because they'll stand up in the fridge, right? Uh, I put some coffee in the bottom of them, fill them up with water, keep them in the mini bar overnight. And then in the morning, you can pour it through the disposable filter that comes with your coffee maker in your hotel room right. or put it through an AeroPress or, you know, even through a face cloth in a pinch. This is how, my friends, you do a 24-book tour, a <laughs> 24-city tour for your book. <laughs> Tell me about it. I, I, I uh, Last night after my gig at the Harvard Bookstore in, um, in Cambridge, I drove in a car. They drove me all the way to Newark for four hours, and I slept in the back of the car as best as I could. And then I had a hotel room for an hour and a half. Jeez. And then I flew to Houston, oh, Corey. slept as best as I could then, and then I switched planes and came here to New Mexico. And then I've done back-to-back -back presentations ever since. I haven't had a break yet. And I'm going straight from this to another presentation. <laughs> oh, Corey, I'm so grateful that you could spend some time well, with us. I'm I really so appreciate happy it. That you put me on. I'm, I'm just, if I seem a little fuzzy, You're, uh, it's only you know what? When yeah. you're fuzzy, then you're a little bit closer to my level. And I can understand what you're talking uh, about. So, because when you're on, man, I can't just go. I just go. I'm gonna make notes, and maybe in a few years, I'll understand what Corey's talking. About. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> you're Thanks. way too brilliant uh, when you're on on. So thank you for for d dumbing yourself down to our level. And I'm oh. sorry it took exhaustion to do it. <laughs> ah. Well, there it is. All you need to do. This is this is the first day on the tour when I haven't had time to make my own coffee in the morning, and I think it's it's starting to get to oh, me. Oh, Corey. I think that having my own magic bean juice was really the secret uh, mojo. Of absolutely. Tour. Corey Doctorow, craphound.com. He's a founding editor of boingboing.net, and his uh, new book, Homeland, is just out, and for the third week on the New York Times bestseller list. That must make you feel good. We're going to take a little break. When we come back, Corey, I want to ask you, what what's on your agenda? What, you know, once you go home and take a long nap, uh, what's next for Corey Doctorow? And we're going to have more with Corey in uh, just a little bit. Our show today brought to you by our friends at Pond5.com. Now, see, this is the right idea. It's, it's royalty-free illustrations, photos, music tracks, sound effects, uh, motion graphics templates, 3D models that you can use in your presentations, in your podcast, whatever you're making. And everybody's happy. The, the people who create the content love Pond5 because Pond5 pays the highest royalties in the business and the media makers get to set their own price. That's great. You're getting great deals. And look at the variety. 1.5 million stock videos. Uh, 8.2 million photos. 735,000 illustrations, musics, everything. Now, there's always a free video of the week. If you scroll down just a little bit, I like that dog. I don't know what that... This week, uh, the free clip is Ants in a Line. Now, you can download that minus the Pond 5. Now, I think you could use that in your next PowerPoint. There's all sorts of things that could refer to, right? Those Ants in a Line. But I got something even better for you. How would you like 50 free stock media files? Uh, music, pictures, everything. 50 free when you go to Pond 5 dot com slash triangulation p-o-n-d the number five dot com slash triangulation the idea here and i think it's a great idea is they're willing to give you these 50 free files for use in any way you see fit royalty free because in order to do this you have to sign up for a pond five account and get used to how you browse and how you check out and stuff and so then you'll be comfortable and the next time you say i really need a shot of abstract pedestrians walking the streets of the city or somebody keyboarding or or Stonehenge, you go, you know who'll have that for ten dollars? Pond five will have that. So once so just give it a try. Look at all this cool stuff you can get. Free. Pond5.com slash triangulation. And if you make media, if you're a videographer, a photographer, illustrator, you should really think about Pond5 for your stuff. A great way to make money on the side. Uh, with the best royalty rates in the business. Everybody's happy. Pond5 dot com slash triangulation we're talking Fair to enough. Corey. <laughs> we're talking to Corey Doctorow author of Little Brother just out uh, and uh, Neil Gaiman says a wonderful important book I'd recommend little oh he's talking about Little Brother the, the, the predecessor to this I'd recommend Little Brother over pretty much any book I've read this year but when you get Neil Gaiman 
uh, log rolling for you. You're, you're doing pretty yeah. good, Corey. Well, and skip down to the last one there. I've got a blurb from uh, Judge Alex Kaczynski, too, the, the Chief Justice of the Ninth Circuit. Wow, the Ninth Circuit, the most liberal, in fact, the only liberal court of appeals in the United States. I'm a huge fan of Little Brother. Reading about Milky, Angie, and their friends helps me visualize the escalating intrusions on our freedom and privacy wrought by advances in technology. This book describes a dystopia that seems chillingly plausible and near. And that's from a guy who could actually do something about it. Yeah, wow. it's, it's, I'm, I'm pretty amazed that Kaczynski is a fan of my books, but uh, I heard this from an EFF lawyer who was at some dinner and, and he said, you work at EFF, do you know Cory Doctorow? So we <laughs> corresponded, he was kind enough to give wow. me a quote, it was great. That is, that is really awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. So, uh, you, you know, writing has become, and by the way, we should mention that, you you know, talking about DRM and all of that, you've always made your books available in varieties of ways. Are these books available uh, freely in some way? Yeah, it's a, it's a free Creative Commons download, just like Amazing. all the other books. And also, if you like it and you don't want to buy another copy, if the free book is all you want, but you want to thank me, I have a long list of schools and libraries, halfway houses and prisons where the people who work there would like a free copy. And I have their address published on my website and you can buy a copy and ship it to them from whatever your favorite bookseller is. And uh, that way you can sort of pay your debt forward in real time. It's very nice. I just, I think this is so amazing. And, and I think I always use you as an example when people say, oh, piracy is going to put us out of business. We can't sell records. We can't sh sell movies. Right. I say, you know, Cory Doctorow's doing okay, and he gives well, so, everything away. So here's the thing, right? Everybody's books are available as free downloads. Right. It's just that with mine, you don't have to break the law to do <laughs> you it. You don't have to feel right? bad about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and so what I – I like to think of this as like performing generosity and trust oh, and, and doing that to kind of effect a social contract with the reader – who could otherwise get it for free if she wanted to, such that she feels a stake in my future and does whatever she can to make Good. my future better because I'm the kind of guy who doesn't call her a crook. Yeah. And that's the thing that always gets me is that the movie industry and the recording industry really believe that we're thieves. Yeah. That's yeah. pretty demeaning and, to be told that. Well, Every time I go to a movie... Yeah, me too. Yeah, there's nothing there's nothing more shocking than paying as I do in London 13 pounds, which yeah. is uh, you know, yeah. 1 squillion dollars to go see a movie and then be subjected to uh, you know, Don't a ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you you wouldn't steal a you wouldn't steal a car. <laughs> so why are you stealing our movies? I just That's paid right. a lot of money. I'm not stealing your damn yes, movie. Yes, this is let me <laughs> let me show you my ticket stub, Mr. Protectionist. Um so anyway, you asked what's coming up. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, so the next thing that will be published by me is actually a, a follow-up to Homeland that will be out in just a couple of weeks in mid-March. Okay. Uh, it's a novella that follows from Homeland but doesn't spoil it, so you can read them out of order, called Lawful Interception. And it was actually commissioned by the White House. What? Uh, yeah, so the White House is doing this series of technology challenges uh, with um, Intel's futurist Brian David Johnson where they're putting up cash prizes a bit like the X Prize where you can claim it if you make a technology that's on their list of things that they want to see in the real world. And uh, Brian from Intel, the, the futurist there, Brian David Johnson, uh, is a great fan of something we call prototyping in fiction or design fiction, where science fiction writers describe how a technology would be used in the real world, and that inspires the engineers in their, in their engineering discussion. And so they commissioned a story for me, uh, and it's going out in mid-March. It'll be published jointly on Tor.com, WhiteHouse.gov, and I believe Intel.com as well. That's and they're awesome. going to do a print edition. That's one of the things, in fact, the Wall Street Journal uh, noted that when it was reviewing Homeland, that, that sets you apart, which is you're, you're, of course, a great writer and talking about great themes, but unlike others like George Orwell, uh, you understand the technology. You're right up to the minute on the current technology. So it, it's, a, it's a nice mix. Yeah. I mean, I think that there is a, a generation of science fiction writers. It's swung around again after the cyberpunks who mostly treated uh, computers as um, metaphors. Right. We kind of swung around to science fiction writers who grew up reading the cyberpunks and went off to make – uh, the technology that they that they read about in the cyberpunks and ha as a result ended up incredibly well versed in the technology and now write about it in a very kind of rigorous mimetic way, a way that kind of corresponds to reality. Um, actually, you know, if I can plug it, someone else's Please. book here. Yeah. Um, I just uh, a couple of days ago on the tour, I finished a book written by my old student from the Viable Paradise Workshop, Leonard Richardson, called Constellation Games. That's a spectacular 
computer-driven uh, first contact science fiction novel about a game developer who, after the aliens come to Earth and build a base on the moon, sends them an email and says, you know, I review really crappy video games. Have any of the um, civilizations you've encountered in the last 90 million years had any video games that I might review? And these kind of weird anarchist aliens who set up this base on the moon fire a bunch of, of revived game systems down onto the earth in re-entry foam from their base on the moon <laughs> and uh, he starts reviewing their video games <laughs> a spectacular novel it's not just funny it's also really clever and full of all kinds of great um ruminations about art and compassion oh, yeah. and politics and it's just a wonderful book first contact through video yeah. games <laughs> You know, you, you make a really good point because I love Neuromancer. I love William Gibson. When I found out that Neil Stevenson writes longhand with pen and William Gibson really didn't like computers at all, it was a little bit disheartening. Um, so I think you're right. It, it, this is a different generation and, uh, and uh, one that embraces technology in a very different way. Uh, than well, although to be fair, I think Bill just didn't know much about technology. Right. I think he likes technology. He just couldn't afford it very right. much. Right. Uh, and Neil was a programmer. He just kind of, I think, to save his wrists and also because he found himself blocked at the keyboard and distracted, switched oh, okay. to a All right. But they, they're, you know, they're they're all into technology, but they didn't grow up. Um, it's a different generation. Yearning to go to cyberspace. Right. 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 They grew up writing about. They made it up. Yeah. Grew up yearning to go to cyberspace. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Oh, certainly no disrespect meant at all. I'm a huge yeah. fan of both. Um, um, so Bill, you want to keep Bill doing gave fiction? Me my watch. Oh, you're this kidding. Is, that's this is a, William a watch G from the William Gibson collection. How's that for a oh, little bit of Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty good. Cool. It's it's analog, by the way. I might it's point out. <laughs> it's, it's former Soviet military. Those those red bands are um, oh, wow. radio silence times. Oh, I like it. Now that's a handy thing to know. Yes. We're getting close yeah. to a radio silence. We don't want to go on too long. That's right. You write fiction and you write nonfiction. You were, of course, the European uh, uh, attaché for the EFF and, and all of that. Uh, do you, do you, it seems like you found, you've really found your voice in fiction. Do you want to keep doing that or are you going to – what's your future plan? Well, I've done some nonfiction too. And oh, I've got I know. More. I have it. I've just finished a full-length nonfiction uh, book, oh, not good. a collection of essays, uh, called Information Doesn't Want to Be Free. And it's, it's – um, it's basically about the about business and the internet and how to do business on the internet that doesn't make the internet less safe or less free. And that also doesn't uh, transfer all the negotiating leverage to companies like Amazon or Apple. Right. So I, I think it's a good book. And uh, my agent is shopping it around right now. I got uh, very generous introductions for the book from uh, Neil Gaiman and Amanda Palmer awesome. that I think really set it off as well. Awesome. Um, yeah, Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom must be read. Somebody was just saying uh, that is awesome, and there's a free audio book at craphound.com uh, yeah, for that. It's the 10th anniversary this month of Down and Out in the Magic oh, Kingdom. you're kidding. Was yeah, that your first that? novel? was, yeah. Yeah, wow. So it's got me thinking, actually, that my next fiction book may be a prequel to Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom. I, I'd, I'd like that. Yeah, it'd be nice like to revisit that. that. Like, I'd never really written a sequel before this, and writing Homeland was kind of like discovering that all my best high school friends yeah. were still hanging out together, still having <laughs> awesome adventures, and were totally happy to have me come along for the ride. So <laughs> I'm thinking revisiting Down and Out the Magic Kingdom would be pretty fun now. How fun. What is, what is, a, what is a hot button uh, topic for you uh, these days? I know we've talked about DRM in the past, piracy and all of that stuff. What, what's, what's, what's going on? What do you care about now a lot? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess I'm I'm pretty interested and worried about the lawful interception industry. Uh, these are the companies that do deep packet inspection, that do malware, uh, you know, malware-based spyware surveillance technology, um, drone surveillance, and so on. And the, the growth of all of this stuff and the companies that make it and try to stitch it together and produce what amounts to um, – guilt by accusation by algorithm where these this huge amount of data that's being collected from you using methodologies that are totally opaque and ne need not be any more rigorous than the ones used by the copyright trolls that threaten people with spurious lawsuits for downloading pornography um, nevertheless then are, are sell this technology off to governments that use it to figure out who to actually like arrest or put under suspicion or add to a no-fly list and I'm, I'm i'm really worried that we're entering into a system of like totally automated uh, surveillance, accusation, and assumption of guilt. Yep. Well, like uh, the copy, what is this? This new CAS system, the six-strike yeah. system that they just implemented today. 
or yes. Oh yeah, it's yeah. brutal. So after after I think your third accusation, if you're an AT and T customer, after your third an- unsubstantiated copyright infringement accusation, you lose YouTube and Facebook until you um, complete a Recording Industry Association of America designed copyright reeducation boot camp. Uh. And then that, and once you've passed the exam at the end, that says that you fully absorbed and come on board with the record industry's weird version of how copyright law is supposed to work, then you get your YouTube back. Horrible. Yeah, it's brutal. Horrible. It's it's a kind of corporatist private law that's like half Huxley, half Orwell. It, but it's a compromise, right? Because the the three strikes law knocked you off the internet entirely. Yeah, but the, there's no statute here that gave them the six strikes law. It wasn't right. like there was any credible threat that Congress would pass a three strikes law. What happened was the phone companies, the cable companies just rolled over for it. Right. They said, yeah, why not? And since we have such gutless telecoms regulation where the FCC has killed any broadband competition, once your local ISP you know, sells out to big content, you can't change ISPs. So you know, why would they ever bother to – enact policies that make their customers happy when, um, you know, their customers can't go anywhere else. It's that, it's that Lily Tomlin, you know, what are you going to do where the phone company, we don't have to care. Right. You know, it, 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 we've, we've arrived at that, that world through the magic of regulatory capture and weak regulation from the FCC. Kevin Marks is in the chat room. He says, and he says, by the way, one of the advantages of having your books online is you can grep the text. He says, search for torrent in, uh, cra- in Homeland to find out how to get around six strikes. <laughs> yes, there you go. <laughs> That's all we'll say. <laughs> it's, a, it's a thing you do, not a thing you read. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, hi, Kevin. Uh, yeah, Kevin says hi. So uh, you mentioned doing this thing f- uh, for the White House. How, what's your, how do you feel about uh, President Obama these days? I, uh, disappointed? Uh, encouraged? Yeah, disappointed is a Disappointed is pretty good for – I mean obviously like any administration is not monolithic, right? They're big and they have lots of things going on in them. Uh, and I'm not American, so I don't get a vote, right? right. But that stuff said, to have a president who promised transparency, who promised to shut down Guantanamo, who promised uh, an end to rendition, uh, to then have that president go around and say, well, there's secret interpretations of Patriot that allow us to go on wiretapping, to instruct his Justice Department, to block attempts, to call – Uh, the NSA to account and the phone companies to account for their system of warrantless wiretapping, for them to have a secret interpretation of a law that allows them to affect kill lists and uh, drone strikes on Americans off the field of battle uh, and to have that be somehow lawful, um, to have uh, the greater use of official secrets than any government in the history of of America, to prosecute more more whistleblowers than any other government in the history of America is so disappointing because it's not what we were promised no and to appoint a monsanto executive to assistant director of the fda and and a new sec commissioner who was a lawyer who fought to keep banks from being regulated you just wonder who's in charge here well and this is why larry lessig's root strikers is so important because you know we know why this happens right the reason that you get laws that reflect the interests of large wealthy corporations is that, that to get elected you need a lot of money and the right. best way to get a lot of money is to ask rich people for it right. and the best way to get them to continue giving you money is to pass laws that make them richer and they get to use that money to get you reelected lather rinse repeat and three or four election cycles later it's a felony to find out whether or not your phone is spying on you and so uh, you know larry says we got to get the money out of politics we've yep. got to fix campaign finance and being a constitutional lawyer he understands that anything that will raise a constitutional challenge is probably a no-go. So he's not saying, oh, well, let's bump off a few Supreme Court justices and get rid of Citizens United. Instead, with his rootstrikers.org, he has proposed that we issue vouchers to the general public that allows them to contribute directly to um, political campaigns, but that any politician who takes public money, voucher money, for their political campaign can't take PAC money. So that the optimal strategy to get elected is always to please as many voters as possible, not to suck up to as many large rich corporations as possible. And I think that that's that's a remarkably outside of the box way of solving this problem. Um, You know, I think that it's pretty credible that lawmakers might vote to get more money. Right. Because that's what you're asking them to do here. Um, And I think that um, having done that, we may be able to start fixing this. Yeah, I thought it was really telling that Larry, who for so long was. 
uh, fighting, uh, you know, uh, the record industry and, and, and DRM realized, you know, you're not going to make any headway in any of this stuff until you restructure how we elect officials. Yeah, we were talking about broadband policy before, and one of the examples that Larry cites is North Carolina, you know, which has the research triangle and is, their economy is very dependent on high tech. But North Carolina has, I think, the second or third worst broadband in the country, and their their uh, state senate pa or their state government passed a law prohibiting municipalities from competing with the phone companies <laughs> that have given them right. the second worst. <laughs> internet service in the country, right? Why would you do this unless you were, you know, responsible to the phone companies in instead of responsible to the voters? Yeah. You know, there are places where there is no broadband, but it's against the law for the city to provide broadband. It's just, uh, it's amazing. It's a little bit rigged too, because uh, of course the people in power do everything to stay in power. And uh, the, they, the system that works uh, to put them in power is very difficult to change because the people who get to change it are the ones who are benefiting from it. Well, that's why I like Larry's suggestion because basically you're only asking Congress to give themselves more money. Yes. And, uh, and I think that, that you can sell that, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, and I think that there's lots of Congress people who would prefer not to have to be lapdogs. I agree. I think that, yeah, I agree. I think that they don't necessarily, they get into it for altruistic reasons, but then the reality of the situation impinges. Corey, we're going to yeah. let you go. You're so great. It's always great to talk to you. Well, thank you. A man full of ideas, uh, a great writer. Uh, you re got to read home. This will, this is subversive stuff that's going to get in your kid's library. How about that? And, yeah. and prisons and schools all over the country. And uh, <laughs> more power to you. Homeland, the name of it. Sequel to Little Brother. Read both. Uh, and craphound.com is uh, Corey's personal page. And of course, boingboing.net. Uh, great to see you, Corey. I hope you get some rest sometime soon. Thank you, Leo. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get to sleep next week. <laughs> I'll sleep when I'm dead. Thank you, yeah. Corey Dr. O. Take care. See you. We do triangulation every Wednesday at uh, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern time. Tune in because it's always fun. Normally, I give the chat room uh, more. Well, I, 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 I brought you into the conversation a little bit. But, uh, gosh, when I can get Corey to myself, I'm going to keep him to myself. That's always the problem. We've got more great guests coming on Triangulation. Make sure you watch every Wednesday. And if you can't watch live, uh, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern Time. And uh, that's 2300 UTC, I think, something like that, on twit.tv. Do download uh, on-demand versions available after the fact, audio and video. Always creative comments, always free at twit.tv. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on Triangulation. Triangulation.